Today's talk is about ice on Mars. It's by Reed Parsons, who's a grad student in the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And uh, Reed did his undergraduate work in the um, science of Earth systems at Cornell. And he's now a graduate student working with Francis Nimmo at, at UC Santa Cruz. And he will tell us about um, ice on Mars. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Cynthia. And thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I apologize, I'm a little jet lagged because I was just came from Japan where I was working with uh, Hideaki Miyamoto doing some numerical simulations of ice flow on Mars. Um, but like Cynthia says, I'm working with Francis over in Santa Cruz. And today I'm going to talk about um, ice in unexpected places on Mars. Um, and my outline, um, talk about recent climate change on Mars. More and more information is coming down from the spacecraft, uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and uh, a host of other missions that have gone to Mars are telling us more and more about young features related to ice and water. And these features are interesting because they're telling us that Mars might not be quite the cold, dead place we thought it was, and in fact might be a very interesting and active place currently. And um, I'll talk about some of these observations that we've made from remote sensing, um, specifically about uh, surficial ice, and then try to use some information about geomorphic features to uh, get us a handle on how deep the ice can go. And I'm going to look at crater softening uh, to address this question. And another interesting feature that uh, we've been most recently studying on Mars are these lobate debris aprons, which look to be like massive deposits of ice at mid-latitudes um, where we wouldn't expect ice to be stable currently. And I will, um, so I'm talking about climate change on the surface and this is what Mars looks like currently, but maybe not too long ago, Mars might have looked something like this. And we have ice stable at latitudes, um, much lower latitudes than we find ice today. So I don't know if everyone here is too familiar with Mars, but I'll give you a quick background. Here is a global topographic map. Uh, we have the Tharsis Montes here, the large volcanic province, Valles Marineris, um, and the large outflow channels feeding into the northern lowlands. Um, and this is the lowland highland dichotomy boundary separating the lowlands from the old cratered highlands. And we see in the cratered highlands, we see the large outflow channels, and we see these valley networks, which are very old features, dating back three and a half to four billion years old. And we also have phyllosilicate detections we've made from remote sensing. This is a, uh, from the Omega instrument. And these colored uh, blotches are um, aluminum and magnesium rich uh, phyllosilicates. This one found near Marth Vallis along the dichotomy boundary here. And again, these are very, found in very old places. However, there are very young features related to water on Mars, namely these gullies, which uh, are found on mid latitudes in both hemispheres. And these are basically um, uncratered deposits of material being transported from the gullies downslope to the bottom of craters. Um, and they're found in other places than craters, but um, these are very young features, in some cases uncratered. And there are also these features that look like they're related to flowing deposits of ice, such as concentric crater fill. We have uh, a crater here, it's about 12 kilometers in diameter, and it looks like material is sort of slumping off and flowing in a viscous ma manner to fill in this crater over time. And just north of this location are uh, a place where we find these lobate debris aprons, which look to be massive deposits of ice. Um, this is about, ten, uh, let's see, seven kilometers scale bar. And they emanate from these high plateaus and move down slope and terminate in what look to be like moraines, like glaciers uh, that we observe on Earth. 
And here's a perspective view from this location. So this is telling us something about recent climate history on Mars. And if we look at the global distribution of these features, uh, on the top panel here are the distribution of what's known as a dissected terrain, which looks like an ice-rich unit from which uh, ice has sublimed to leave a pitted texture. And those are distributed along these mid-latitude bands. Uh, these red blotches are locations of mock images from which uh, these, this study was done. And below that we find these uh, lobate debris apron distributions are, fall, a sim, fall along a similar trend in location along these mid-latitudes. And similarly, gullies are also found in these mid-latitudes where ice might have been recently deposited. <coughs> now if we compare this with what we, where we think ice should be stable now, uh, this is a global uh, circulation model result for where, how deep the ice table should be currently on Mars. And you see it extends down to maybe 50 degrees uh, latitude in both hemispheres, but shouldn't extend, um, we don't know really how far it extends in depth. This is in the upper meter. And we have some remote sensing constraints on this uh, on ice, surficial ice on Mars from the neutron spectrometer on board Mars Express, which um, is detecting hydrogen in the near, in the upper meter surface of Mars. And uh, in high latitudes, it agrees well with this GCM result. However, there are some indications of low latitude or equatorial uh, hydrogen detections in the upper meter of Mars. And whether or not this is a simple hydrogen concentration, and it's assumed that that hydrogen is locked up as water. And, um, however, it might be locked up in mineral assemblages as well. That's something we have yet to unravel. So how would water get to these mid-latitude locations? Well, um, recently we've figured out that there's a lot of, uh, that the tilt axis of Mars changes widely with time. And this happens on Earth as well, which causes uh, episodic glaciation on this planet. But the existence of our large moon helps to stabilize our obliquity. And because Mars doesn't have a large moon, its obliquity varies greatly with time. And um, this is the location of the Phoenix Lander. I stole this from the University of Arizona website. But um, Basically, at high obliquity, the sun is hitting the poles more directly, and you're evaporating a lot of volatiles, water, and CO2 ice off of the pole, creating a more humid environment in which you might have a more active hydrologic cycle. And conversely, at low obliquity, you have low sun on the poles and low humidity. And this is a plot of how obliquity has varied over the past 10 million years. Um, based on calculations from Lascar in 2002. And this was really a boon from our scientists. Now we have some explanation for why these deposits should exist at lower latitudes. At high obliquity, you can transport this water down to uh, lower latitudes. And the problem is we don't really know what happens beyond 10 million years ago because the system is chaotic and we can't uh, accurately constrain what the obliquity was in the past. And so what my work has been focused on is looking at geomorphic evidence for climate change um, in the more distant past. And one of these uh, features that I focused on are craters, softened craters on, at mid to high latitudes on Mars. So we have these surface detections from remote sensing and uh, expected uh, ice in the subsurface based on GCM results. But the question is, how deep does that ice go? And we conducted uh, numerical simulations of ice-rich creep in craters to see how we might expect these craters to relax over time. And we specifically looked at this uh, idea of developing a north-south slope asymmetry. And I'll describe what that means in the next slide. And finally, in this section, I'll, I'll talk about observations of crater so softened craters at the end. So the idea is that you have some layer of ice-rich material in the near surface, and the depth to which it extends, we are unsure. But 
you might expect a north-south slope asymmetry to develop in this crater over time due to the angle of incident sunlight warming up the equator facing side of the of the crater more than the pole facing slope and the idea is that the warmer ice will flow more rapidly than the cold ice and you'll get gentler slopes on the equator facing side and here we are assuming some fraction of dust in the ice rich layer and some thickness of that material these are variables that we're we don't know. And if we uh, talk about, these are a numerical simulation result of an initial crater profile after 100 million years of viscous relaxation, assuming a dust fraction of 80%, so relatively ice poor, um, and a thickness of 125 meters, you can see that there's this, radio, this slope asymmetry that the equator facing side uh, is more gently sloping than the pole facing side. Now there's an, uh, a discontinuity here because this is a radially symmetric simulation and so uh, we just do the uh, equator facing side and then do the pole facing slide but they don't communicate with each other so there's this discontinuity here. And um, this asymmetry is coming from a difference in temperature between the pole facing side and the equator facing side, which is what is plotted in this panel. And so we thought, well, this is a good idea. Maybe we should um, um, quantify this asymmetry and then go look at craters and see what we can find. And so this asymmetry parameter is simply the difference in angle divided by uh, the mean angle. And doing a number of these simulations at different latitudes, we found that this asymmetry should peak at mid-latitudes because that's where the temperature difference between the two faces of the crater are going to be the greatest. And there's also a dependence on this creeping layer thickness, the depth to which the ice extends. And uh, that's because at, um, at low thicknesses, you're having little relaxation occur, so not very much asymmetry can develop. And also, but at very high thicknesses, you're actually having so much relaxation occur that the slopes are actually becoming more similar in slope over time as it fills in um, almost completely. So, so we thought, okay, well, let's go look at craters and see what we find. So here's an example of uh, one of the craters we selected. And we're somewhat limited in resolution here to craters about 18 kilometers in diameter. And that's simply because that's the resolution of the topography data that we have. So we took radial profiles along these craters and averaged the northern face and the southern face to get these characteristic profiles from, from each side of the crater. And when we look at the data, um, it's not too convincing. We have asymmetry plotted versus latitude. These lines are our numerical model result and these scattered dots are the observations. And these boxes with the error bars are means from each of those latitude bins. So you see that the asymmetry that we were predicting to happen isn't actually showing up very well. Um, but all is not lost because we can look at depth to diameter ratios of these craters as well to see um, if they're actually relaxing as much as we would expect them to. Um, but before I look at depth to diameter ratios, this is a compilation of um, assuming the asymmetry is not getting greater than 0.2, which it looks like it isn't based on the previous slide, then these are the constraints that are placed on the depth to which that ice rich layer extends and the dust content. Basically, the more the dustier the ice rich layer is, the more viscous it is, and the greater uh, thickness that you can accommodate because not very much relaxation will occur if it's very dusty. So you see, for 250 million year old craters, um, you're not getting thicknesses much greater than 100 meters. Well, if we look at depth to diameter ratios, here I've plotted this slope asymmetry versus depth to diameter ratio. And this is a simulation result with these crosses spaced every 25 million years. And these uh, our data from 45 degrees north, 30 degrees south, and 40 degrees south. And you see that although we are not getting the asymmetry values that we observe, 
we can replicate relatively well the depth to diameter ratios of these craters. And that can at least place some constraint on what this uh, thickness has to be. So we're getting something like 150 meters of ice rich regolith. And that there are other surface processes that are likely occurring to modify craters, which are reducing the asymmetry that we were expecting to see. And the main take thing I took away from this is that we should look at the observations before we develop the theory. And this was, in one instance, this asymmetry expectation um, you know, didn't pan through for us. But we're still able to make meaningful uh, constraints on what this ice-rich table should look like. So with that lesson in hand, when we started getting radar observations from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we were very interested in using their observations to then constrain a numerical model of how ice might flow on the surface. So I'm going to move on now to these other features, uh, low bay debris aprons, which are these ice-rich deposits that we find at mid-latitudes. I'll first give you an introduction of what these features are uh, prior to the radar observations. And then I'm going to talk about uh, results from the Sherrod instrument on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And then I'll also talk about the numerical model that we developed to get a handle on how fast these ice-rich deposits might be flowing. So the characteristic location in which these uh, features are found is in the fretted terrain along the dichotomy boundary in the northern hemisphere. And if we zoom in, you can see that along these plateaus and massifs scattered into the northern lowlands, um, there are these aprons of material which are relatively smooth in topography. And if we zoom in, this is uh, Viking imagery. Um, you can see that along all of these plateaus, there's these smoothed out deposits surrounding them. Here's topography again. These plateaus are about one, one and a half to three kilometers in relief. And this is a infrared image of this location. This is a nighttime infrared giving you the temperature of the surface. Um, and dark colors are cool and bright colors are relatively high temperature. And what this is telling us is the grain size of the material on the surface of Mars. So if you go to the beach, you know that after sunset, the beach gets really cold fast because it's made of fine-grained sand. But if you stand next to some rocks, they're actually relatively warmer at night because they can retain their heat longer during the nighttime. And that's what this image is telling us, that these features are covered with relatively fine-grained material. So I'm going to show you now a context CTX image from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. This image is 25 kilometers wide and has a resolution of 5 meters per pixel. And so here again we have one of these high plateaus. And coming out of it is this smooth deposit of material. And you can see some uh, con um, compression folds and textures that are reminiscent of sublimation of ice from the subsurface. And moving north, here's the end of that deposit. And then here's another one around a massif to the north. And again, you have these conjugate folds or compression folds, which look are reminiscent of glacial flow on Earth. And so people have known about these features for a very long time. And ice was hypothesized to be involved in their formation since the beginning. But the two questions were, how much ice and how thick are those deposits? And that's something we didn't know for a long time until we started getting results from the Sherrod instrument. And Sherrod is a shallow radar on board Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. <clears throat> and it's a 10 meter dipole antenna um, operating at 15 to 25 megahertz, giving a radar wavelength of about 10 meters. So that's our vertical resolution. And I'm going to show you data from uh, this ground track in this area that I was showing you previously. And when the radar flew over these low bay debris aprons, which is shown here, this sort of smooth material, the ground return split into two signals. We have a surface return, and then we're getting a subsurface reflection. And 
What's interesting is when we apply a wave speed for the radar of ice, we can convert the time to depth, and these reflectors flatten out to be parallel or continuous with the surface surrounding them. So, and we know these are subsurface reflections because they've, the Plout group um, modeled what the surface return should be due to backscatter um, from the surrounding topography, and you don't get these reflections that we see in the data. So these really are subsurface returns giving us actual thicknesses of these deposits. And we find that they're between 300 to 700 meters thick, very massive deposits. And furthermore, using the strength of this return signal, you can actually constrain how much dust is mixed in with the ice. And because the signal is so strong, the reflected signal is so strong, um, they constrain the dust fraction to less than 10%. So this is relatively clean ice in um, places where ice isn't stable now. And now we, we don't see um, ice on the surface of these features. Um, I should state that these are buried below some material of fine grain material and is being prote protected from sublimation. So the next question is how old are these? And if you use crater age dating techniques um, adopted from the moon, you can have here you plot uh, crater density versus crater diameter, and you have these isochrons um, for different ages of that surface. Now, um, I should note that this was adopted from the moon, basically. You take crater diameters or densities from the moon, and we have rocks that we've actually dated from the moon, and we can use that as a calibration. Now, whether or not those crater densities apply to the same ages on Mars as they do the moon, is an open question, but um, for lack of a better tool, this is what uh, Mars scientists have been doing. And we get something between maybe 10 million years to 500 million years. Uh, it's a big span of time. So our goal has been to look at numerical simulations of how these ice deposits should flow to maybe constrain um, how old they could be. So just a brief uh, introduction to the theory that we're using. We use a flow law for ice in which strain rate depends on a flow parameter times the stress to some power. Now this flow parameter is basically a viscosity term, which depends on the temperature of the ice and is scaled according to some viscosity at the melting temperature. And we also have this effect from dust, which is phi, um, which is telling us that the more dust there is, the higher the viscosity will be. And so um, using this equation and plugging in um, A and uh, the shear stress, which is rho g h sine theta, um, using n equals 3, we can determine what the change in the thickness of the ice sheet is going to be with time. We just integrate this equation, and we have this equation for the change in the thickness of the ice sheet at a given point with time. And uh, what's interesting to note is that it depends on the thickness of the ice sheet to the fifth power. So it's very strongly dependent on the ice sheet thickness. And that comes out of this selection of n equals 3. Um, and there is uh, an open question of which value of n to use. And to reiterate that point, I plot viscosity versus stress. And these dots are the differential stress that an ice sheet on a three degree slope on Mars would experience. So this is a 100 meter thick ice sheet, 200 up to one kilometer. And these are, the colored lines are experimental results of ice deformation experiments done at different temperatures for different grain sizes of ice. And, um, something you should notice is that there's these different regimes in which ice behaves differently. At high stress, we have dislocation creep, um, which follows a slope of uh, n equals 3 in the equation that I presented in the last slide. But at lower stress, the ice actually deforms by the sliding of individual crystals past one another. And this has a different slope and a different value for n. But it becomes more complicated because now it's, 
the viscosity isn't just dependent on the temperature, but also on the grain size. So you see um, 0.1 millimeter grains uh, are much less viscous than larger grains. So um, we're using a value of n equals 3, but other experimentalists have come up with values of even n equals 4 for this, lo for this region of stress. So it's not something that is completely resolved at this point, but um, because it's numerically convenient in a way, and because a lot of terrestrial glaciologists use n equals 3, that's what we use. Now, we could also turn to observations to get a handle on what this value for n should be. <clears throat> and these are topographic profiles made along these low bay debris aprons at various locations by Lee et al. in 2005. And if you compare what those topographic profiles should be to these viscous flow models, you see that um, these different colors correspond to different classifications that Lee et al. came up with. But um, you can see that one of these profiles matches well with an n equals 1 uh, value. And, um, but we're using n equals 3. And, but there's some question about how these features might have been modified since they were in place. These are very steep slopes at n equals uh, 1 even, or n equals 3 is even worse. So any landsliding or uh, sublimation of ice from the toe of these features is going to affect the, the profile that you see. So I'll move on to some results from these simulations. This uh, thick line is our initial distribution of ice. And it extends up to uh, 800 meters thick over 10 kilometers distance. And this simulation was run at 215 Kelvin temperature on a flat surface for 500 million years. And these lines are spaced every 100 million years. And you can see that initially it's responding to um, this initial condition that we set up. And it flows very rapidly. But then it slows down as the ice sheet spreads out and extends outward. And this is for a dust fraction of 0.25. So the radar is telling us that things should actually be flowing faster than this. And if we use a dust fraction of 0, you can see that our time scale is now down to 150 million years. And the ice sheets uh, are flowing relatively rapidly. So if we compile these results, we have dust fraction versus temperature of the ice plotted. Um, and these are contours of the time scale for which it takes these uh, ice sheets to flow 8 kilometers. And um, this is sort of an, an ad hoc choice of distance. But you can see that most of these features are about 20 kilometers long. And so um, current mid-latitude temperatures are somewhere around 211. And under some thickness of ice, it might be warmer due to a geothermal uh, input. So maybe we have ages between 150 to uh, maybe 80 million years. So more recently in Japan, I was doing three-dimensional modeling of these ice sheets over topography. And here's a result from these simulations where we have the mas uh, a massif surrounded by ice. Uh, and a flat surface around that. And this is a one and a half kilometer high massif. And the ice thickness is 800 meters to begin with. This is viewing it from the side. You can see that, again, during the first 500,000 years, it flows very rapidly due to the large thicknesses that we started out with. And over time, it flows more gradually until here at the end, I have a very large time step between 5 million years and 9 and a half million years. And it's only flowing a matter of a kilometer during that uh, length of time. And this is a product of our, um, the dependence on the change in thickness on uh, the thickness itself. And that, was, uh, that flow depended on the thickness to the fifth power, remember. So as these things thin out, they are really slowing down. And here's a perspective view uh, with no vertical exaggeration of the final product of that simulation. So the implications um, are that we have these 
young features on Mars which are related to recent climate change on the planet. And these are large volumes of ice at mid-latitudes that are active today to modify the surface. Not only these low-bait debris aprons, but also gullies and other features related to mid-latitude ice. So Mars is not the dead planet we thought it was. Um, and these are large deposits of ice that are a potential resource not just for potential life, but for human exploration of the planet. Um, these are very large deposits of ice. And as another implication, just to reiterate that, these are gullies found at mid-latitudes. And here's that ice-rich mantling unit, which is uh, a relatively young feature um, found at mid-latitudes, which appears to be related to where we find these gullies. And the implication is that this ice is melting over time to actually result in flow of liquid water over the surface. Now, there's a lot of details to be worked out about how these things actually form, but um, the implication is there. Uh, to conclude, there are long -term ice, the long-term ice content of the Martian regolith is difficult to determine um, because there's an influence of these surface processes with uh, a viscous flow of an ice-rich uh, regolith. So, but we can use the depth diameter ratios to get a thickness of something like 150 meters for this ice rich table. And this would account for 10 to the 7 cubic kilometers of ice, which is about 10 times the current volume of the northern polar cap. Uh, so, low bait debris aprons, gullies, and an ice rich mantling unit are all young features, suggesting ice has been redistributed from the poles to mid latitudes in the recent past. And the volume of ice contained in these low-bay debris aprons globally is about 10 to the 5 cubic kilometers, which is 10% of the northern polar cap. So um, based on crater counts, these uh, low-bay debris aprons appear to be about 100 million years old. And our numerical simulations are uh, in agreement with those dates, to some extent, um, we're getting ages between 50 and 100 million years for these ice-rich deposits. And if uh, these thick, if the ice uh, in these low bait debris aprons is 100, 300 meters thick, then they must, they should probably be flowing currently at about the rate of thir 30 meters per million years. And but more modeling is needed under likely precipitation and ablation conditions to more accurately determine the age of these features, and thus when recent climate change happened on Mars. And that's all I have. I'm a little early, but I'll take any questions. Sure. Um, so wouldn't the dust content of these ice flows um, increase over time as they flow? Like wouldn't they entrain dust from their surroundings? Well, that's a, I think the reason that they exist and we find them today is because they were covered by dust and that protected the ice from subliming. And um, the question is <clears throat> whether or not that dust is actually getting downwardly incorporated in the ice that was pre-existing. So that's, um, something we don't have a good handle on. And I don't know, theoretically, how, I mean, glaciers on Earth will entrain sediment from below as they erode the material beneath them. But um, based on the radar observations, what they're saying is that it's relatively clean. And so um, I'm not sure if we have yet a good understanding of, of <coughs> why they are so clean. With the radar signature, I assume it's detecting the bottom of the pure ice layer. Could there be also right. like a mixed dust ice layer that's not being picked up in the radar that's at the bottom of this flow? Probably. I mean, all the radar can detect is a change in the dielectric constant of the material. So um, if you actually look at very fine-grained dust, it actually doesn't have a wave speed too different than that of ice. And so if you have very fine-grained dusty material on the bottom, it might actually, um, the signal might be propagating through that as well. So, yeah. So your initial map showed hydrogen deposits. Is that consistent with this ice conclusion here? Um, 
Well, yes and no. The hydrogen detections are only finding ice within the upper meter of the surface. So these deposits are likely to be much uh, buried below a thicker regolith layer than one meter. Um, and the radar has a resolution of 10 meters, so it should detect the interface between this upper mantling regolith and the ice that is presumably below it if it's thicker than 10 meters, but we don't see it in the radar. So it's somewhere between one meter uh, and 10 meters based on the radar and from the remote sensing observations. I thought the, um, <clears throat> the lobate debris aprons, uh, the crater counts on the lobate debris aprons show why they cut across the isochrons and I thought they went up to a few hundred million years. Yeah. So what we're seeing there is a, is a very long term effect. Uh, yeah. I, I just want, I, I was just okay. uh, concerned about the last uh, slide where you say a hundred million years, but really it's a few hundred million years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, the lobate debris aprons are puzzling in another respect in that um, they, they, they appear to be very ice rich, as you, as you say, and yet where did the ice come from? It could have joined these periods of uh, high obliquity and low obliquity. It could be, um, it could be being de removed and deposited, and yet these things are a few hundred million years old. Right. The ice could be derived from the massifs. That doesn't appear to be true. I mean, it, I have right. thought for years that that's where the ice was coming from, but the radar uh, doesn't give any ice signal from the massifs. Right. You'd think if the, if the um, ice was being deposited from above, from the atmosphere, mm -hmm. as a result of these obliquity changes, there'd be some asymmetry around these massifs. There's no right. asymmetry around the massifs. So right. what, what, what is your, uh, <laughs> your idea about uh, where the ice is coming from? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. And what I think is interesting is that there seems to be a dissimilarity between lobe debris aprons in the southern hemisphere and in the northern hemisphere in this regard. And um, there's this region east of Hellas Basin where we find lots of lobe debris aprons. And um, they actually seem to be relatively constrained to this region east of Hellas. And the global uh, circulation models that people have been conducting for high obliquity environments on Mars um, anticipate that this region east of Hellas was actually a place where lots of precipitation would occur um, during high obliquity. And so there's an interesting correlation there between where precipitation should happen at high obliquity and these low bay debris aprons in the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, it's a little different. We see in this region that I was focusing on um, evidence for even more extensive glaciation occurring in that region. You have these valleys which extend into the north, uh, southern highlands, which are filled with uh, what's called lineated valley fill, which is basically looks like uh, ice was flowing in these valleys as well. Um, and so these valleys actually uh, terminate in this region that we find the lobate debris aprons along the dichotomy boundary. So that is an indication that perhaps there is even more extensive glacial glaciation that occurred more widespread in this whole area, and that what we're seeing might be the um, you know, last gasps of this more extensive glaciation that occurred. So you know, we don't know for sure where the ice is coming from, but that's, uh, those are the two hypotheses that are out there right now. The uh, polar lander, the Phoenix uh, polar lander, mm -hmm. was uh, finding that some of that water was very salty, or at least appeared to be. Has, mm. Is there any way of telling what kind of uh, ice, water ice you got? Um, well, all we have to go on is basically the spectroscopy. And, you know, we, because these things are buried, we can't actually detect what the composition of the ice is. But your At, flow patterns would be a little different. That's true. But actually, um, because uh, salty ice uh, melts at a lower temperature, it should actually be probably uh, more, less viscous than pure ice would. So these things would probably flow even faster than our simulations are indicating, if they're salt.
I'd like to first briefly follow up on Mike's comment that um, since most of the small craters are secondary craters, what you're looking at, they could, these things may all be the same age, and yeah. that you're just looking at the clumpiness of the secondary craters, because all you have are postage stamps that sample that surface of that age. So I just open right. the possibility that the whole thing is older, that the young ages particularly are likely to be um, uh, artifacts. Okay. Um, with that said, I was, I, was, I was wondering, where does the ice go? Does it, does it leave mostly from the snout, or does it leave mostly from the, um, the flats above? Um, in our, I'm assuming ice is not conserved. No, ice is conserved in this model. In this model. Yeah. But, but on Mars, it in reality? Yeah. <laughs> um, in reality, it's hard to say. I mean, if you have some conduits in the overlying material, ice could obviously sublime and get into the atmosphere. And, um, but that's going to change depending on what the obliquity is. And um, you might have ice being deposited during certain times and being sublimed during other times. So um, I don't think we yet understand well enough how that cycle between the atmosphere and the, and the subsurface is actually occurring. There's a lot we don't understand. <laughs> okay. You, you had a, an estimate of 10 to the seventh cubic kilometers, I believe it was, of ice uh, in one of your slides. Yes. A, was that was that calculated on the basis of the volumes of the lobate debris apens, or was it a uniform ice? Over the whole uh, mid-latitude. Yeah, no, that was more of this global ice table that we constrained based on the crater softening study. So the lobate debris aprons are only counting for 10 to the 5 or so cubic kilometers. And this ice table, which if it ex we don't know if it extends globally or if it's, you know, patchy, um, but if it did extend globally, it would be um, 10 to the 7 cubic kilometers. And you know, there's a lot of, for a long time, we've been questioning where Mars's water has gone because we have these very old features related to, like the outflow channels related to water. We think there was a lot of water on the surface originally. And if you look at the deuterium to hydrogen ratios, which is telling you probably how much water escaped the system, it isn't enough to really account for how much water we observe. There's a missing reservoir for water on the planet. And I think these mid-latitude reservoirs are, uh, a good place to look for that missing water. If you're uh, assuming that, they, uh, that there's a fairly high ice content over the whole of the mid-latitude, why, why is this the source of those lobate debris apron? Um, because, well, it could be. It could be. I mean, it could be coming from the massifs themselves, right. like you described previously. And I don't think that has been ruled out. But it is puzzling that the ice content is different from the lobate debris aprons and the massif. Exactly, yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.